All right, thank you very much. Okay, so did everyone uh, have a chance to get that, that code? Because we're going, it's important. We're going to be doing some interactive component here, so it's important that you get logged into that and have a chance to, to move forward together. Okay, so here we go. So what we're going to do for the next little bit is go through some strategies and some principles that I've found uh, over time to be uh, effective with, with coaches. And I like this idea of using the term best principles instead of best practices. Often uh, we rely on using the term best practices, but what that implies is that there's one right way to do things. There is a best way. When there isn't, there's a, there's a principle that underlies how we do things. So there's best principles that should inform our practices. So we want to be careful. It's just a subtle way of changing how we talk about these things. Best principles instead of best practices. So we're going to start. You'll see periodically we'll pause for an opportunity for you to reflect and uh, respond to some questions using uh, the technology that you've uh, been shared with. So you have a question here. Successful coaches view themselves first and foremost as... And you see your options, sport expert, teacher, manager, counselor. Okay, it looks like we've uh, determined the overwhelming consensus here. Successful coaches view themselves first and foremost as teachers, which is excellent. All those, I mean, all those roles uh, on this question are important. At some point you play all these roles, but the key here is first teacher. Think first like a teacher. So you were listening this morning, so well done. Good job on that one. We got teachers. So what we're going to do for the next little bit is go through um, a cycle of coaching. And when I put this book together, it took three years to accumulate all the information and write the book. And we were trying to think of a, a way to present the information that we've learned about great coaches in a way that would relate to any coach in any sport. And all coaches go through different these common cycles. You, you inherit a team or you build a team. Then you get into your season where you're coaching and competition and practice. And then your season ends and you have some closure. And then you have a moment typically before the next season starts. And there's key things that you want to be doing as a coach in each of these moments or each of these phases. So what should, what do good coaches do in each of these moments? And that's what, some of what I'm going to share with you and then we'll have a few questions as we, as we move through. So we'll look first at the preseason. And the key, you'll notice in the center of this, if I go back here, the center of this uh, cycle, you have four words that all start with E, and the, the four E's. So envision, enact, examine and enhance. So when we start with our teams, when we start come back together with a team, we really want to focus on envisioning. Envisioning what's possible with this group of athletes in this particular cycle in this season. So here's your next question. What is the first step to becoming a quality coach? What is the first step to becoming a quality coach? You can take a moment to read through those, those answers. Oh, I see some of you having fun now. <laughs> there you go. You figured it out, didn't you? <laughs> okay, so we can switch back. So you're right. When, when we get together, the first step that we want to do as a, when we work with our teams is really focus on identifying why. Why do we have a team? Why are we coming together? What's our purpose this year? Yes, we want to win. Everyone wants to win. That's a given. So really what we want to do is work on building a common vision so that we can, we can work towards something together. So the three things that I want to share with you, specific to the preseason that I've found uh, with great coaches, they spend a lot of time in, in that initial moment with their teams, building a vision, clearly identifying what our core values are, what matters to us, and then connecting those values to behavior standards. These are three things that coaches, good coaches do when they come together with their teams, when they start building a team. So I'll share some examples from each of these. So we really want to think as a coach, you have to see things before other people can see them. So you, you have to be able to envision what's possible before other people can see it. So you have to see it before they can see it. And, and a part of what great coaches do, they not only have the, a vision, 
they can share the vision with other people. So you can take the glasses and put them on your athletes or other coaches so they can see what you see, what's possible. So I want you, uh, I'll just read this for you. This is from uh, one of the most successful coaches in the United States right now, talking about when he was first hired. So when he first took over the position he's in now, said they had they being the program. The program had no history, no office, no fans, no gym, no real gym, metal bleachers we had to roll out for big games. The problem is there weren't any big games. So he, his first position was with the worst team in the country. They had no, no history, no legacy, no nothing. Who's this coach? Guy's name is Gino Oriema. And he's now won uh, with the University of Connecticut women's basketball and the U.S. national team, Olympic gold medals, multiple gold medals, 11 national championships. He broke Coach Wooden's records for most wins, most consecutive wins, most national titles. And so this is a coach who, who could see things for what they could become, not what they were. And, and great coaches have that ability to see things, see your, in an athlete what they can become, not what they are. What my program can become, not what it is. Same thing with what Troy and the team's doing here, seeing coaching in Singapore for what it can become, not necessarily what it is. And some things that good coaches do with their teams, they'll, they'll have meetings at the beginning of the year or the beginning of a season where they, have, they call them vision meetings. So they, they ask these kinds of questions with their players. You know, if we really work together, really put our heart and mind to this, what's possible? What could we really achieve? How far could we go? And I like question number three. What kind of season would we like to have so we feel was worth the time and the energy? Because what we're going to try and do is going to be hard. We're going to fail a lot. We're going to, it's going to be messy. We're going to argue. There's going to be uh, low points. So what, what kind of experience would be worth that type of journey? Because that's what excellence requires. You're going to have those moments. So how much are we willing to invest in this? So we, we, the good coaches can see the vision. They can share the vision. They can help athletes buy into the vision. But then they have to connect that vision to values, why we do what we do. And a way to think about values is enduring standards that serve as stable guiding principles. So they guide our action. And more and more what I see with the best coaches all over the world is that they really have a core value, a central value of people first, sports second. And this is Jill Ellis, our women's national team coach for soccer, won the World Cup of, uh, of football um, a few years back when it was in Canada. And she also has coached uh, in college, very successful. And for her, it's always been about people first, sports second. And I see this more and more, and it, and it, it works, it resonates with athletes. Another example of that, and you start to look at coaches across contexts in sports. This is um, Sean Foley, a Canadian golf coach, and at one point coached uh, Tiger Woods and some of the best players in the world, Justin Rose. And I like this from him. You know, I'm not just coaching golfers. I'm coaching people who deal with love and hate and fear, all these emotions. If you look at them as just as a golfer, you're missing out. So, and I could, I could give you many examples of this across many sports. The best really start with a core value of I'm coaching people first, sports second, and I have to treat them that way. And you saw that with the video that uh, Massa showed with that coach from Australia coaching a person, not just a tennis player, right? And so we want to keep this in mind as a, a core value. Better people make better athletes. And the more we invest in helping our athletes become better people, the better they will become as performers. People first, performer second. But we have to show our athletes what that looks like. So we need to make invest time in showing them what those values look like in action and how they, how they can embody those on a regular, everyday basis. And, and this idea of describing what right looks like. So if we want our athletes to be better people, we have to show them what, better, what a better person looks like. Uh, 
What do better people do on a daily basis? And what don't they do? The do's and the don'ts, in a sense. And this was actually um, based on a study from West Point Military Academy, our top, one of our top military academies in the United States, where they made a, a very strong effort to change the culture in that program based around helping the athletes see what good looks like. So these are the values in action, in a sense. Some of the things that I've, I've seen, the ways people have shown athletes what good looks like and what, what to do and what not to do. For example, you look for moments in your, in your environment, when the athletes come to the training field, when they come to the gym, when they come to the pool. Those are all critical moments where you can reinforce the core values, what really matters to us and how do we act. And this is an example from a world champion ice hockey player. I had a chance to talk to him about this. And uh, what he, he, he played with Wayne Gretzky, one of the greatest athletes of all time. He said, when, when we came into our locker room or our dressing room, you, you had to do two things before you came into the locker room. You had to commit to opening that door with positive energy. You had to have the right kind of attitude when you walked through that door. And then as soon as you came into the training room, you had to go around the room and greet every one of your teammates. And think about how your athletes come into a practice or into a training session. Do they just throw their bag down and they get on their phone or they just talk to their one favorite friend versus a championship type of environment where you set the standards and the behaviors around the core values. And you look for those little moments. A uh, famous coach we have right now, uh, Pete Carroll, the Seattle Seahawks, uh, American football. One thing he's done, he actually painted a sign above the wall or on the wall when the players leave their locker room or their training room to go on to the pitch, onto the field, to go and train. And they have to physically touch it. When they leave the training room or the locker room to go to train, they have to touch this sign that says, I'm in. So it, it's a reinforcement, it's a behavior that connects to a value. I'm all in right now. I'm committing to being all in for this moment, for this practice. So you think about your facilities, your pools, your gyms, your arenas, wherever it might be. Where are places where you can get your athletes to connect back to the things that matter to you, to your core values? And the best way to really do that is, is to ask your athletes what that might look like. You need to connect it to things that are meaningful to them. This is our men's basketball coach. Uh, with LeBron James and one of the things he did when he took over our men's national team is uh, sit down with our players and identify what will good look like what are our values and what will that look like on an everyday basis and it's, uh, we, we have, haven't lost a world championship or an Olympics in men's basketball uh, I think in the last three or four Olympics and when he was coach, and the first thing he did when he was hired as coach was get all the players together and identify what are the values going to be for this program and what will these standards look like. And he asked three questions. He said, you know, what matters to me as a coach? So what are my values? What matters to, to you as an athlete? What are your values? And then we come together on identifying what are our values, what are the shared values. And these are just a few examples. And this is a really one of my favorite books it's called The Gold Standard. And it's, it's written by the coach and his daughter who followed him along this journey when he became the head coach for our men's national team. Coach people like Kobe Bryant and LeBron James. And the, you may not remember, but our men's basketball team, um, they had a, a defining moment where they lost to Puerto Rico and they were embarrassed. And they hired this new coach to come in and he said, we, the reason we were losing is because we didn't have a sense of why. Why do we play? Why, why does this matter? So he brought them together, he identified what are some of their core values and then what these things should look like. And this is just a small example of it. He has many others. And then I'll finish the values and standards this preseason with this picture. So I was in Ireland uh, in January, and the rugby team, the All Blacks, they're the world's most successful sports team. And they were playing, they just happened to be playing in Ireland when I was there. And a friend shared this picture with me. So they were taking the train, around, um, and they were getting off the train to play the, the Irish national team. And you look at this picture, what's in this picture? You have 
the number one team in the world, defending world champions, best athletes in the world, most successful team of all time, and they are unloading the train. They're taking all the boxes of gear, equipment. They don't have trainers and staff, and they're going to their hotel to relax. They are emptying all the boxes. They're taking all the boxes off the train. And so you ask yourself, you know, what, what do these values look like in action? This is an example of great athletes living those values. All right, so we're going to have a question here to finish that first phase. Athletes adopt team core values most when, and you have five options here. I'll give you a moment to read these options. Okay, so you, you got that one. You're paying attention. Very well done. Most of you. A few, <laughs> most of you were. So when, when we have a, that first moment with our athletes, that first part of the season, we want to help connect with them and, and identify a vision, values, and what those values look like in action. Just last point there. It's common for us uh, to set values, but we don't often tie them to behaviors. So when we say with our athletes, for example, we want to play with respect. We want to play with integrity. What does that really mean? What, what does that mean to a 14-year-old or an 11-year-old? What is, you have to show them what that looks like. So well done. All right, so we move. Now you're moving into your season. Now you're spending most of your time competing and training. What do we know about what great coaches do in that moment of coaching? We'll give you another chance here to reflect. Athletes learn best when practice activities, and we'll leave this one up for a moment. Okay, don't switch it over yet. Take a moment to look at this. When do athletes learn best? Because the, the heart of your coaching is teaching and learning. So designing training sessions and then managing competitions. So this is interesting because we do have every response. We have people represented in every response here. And when we think about teaching and learning, what, what is the right kind of level of, um, uh, of demand that we want to place on our athletes? And in fact, most of you answered the correct response. Let's go ahead and switch it over. And, and ideally what we want to do is, is just stretch our athletes enough. So just a, a little bit beyond what they can currently do. If it's too hard, that creates frustration. If it's too easy, it's boredom. So we want to stretch them just a little bit beyond what they can currently do. And I'll show you some examples of that. So when we think about in season, what do we know about what good coaches do when they're in season? We have to start with how, understanding of how people learn, so principles of athlete learning. What are the components or what does a good practice look like? So when we design practices, and then how do we best help athletes perform optimally in competition, so competition coaching. When we think of principles of athlete learning, there's three things that I wanted to, to share with you. These are kind of three principles that will best help our athletes uh, learn most effectively. We want to start with understanding where they're at. So their prior knowledge and ability should have a big impact on how we design our practices. We need to understand what they're going to be motivated to want to do. It doesn't matter how well your practice is designed. If the motivation to do the things you're asking them to do is not high, it won't be an effective practice. And then we want to connect deliberate practice with the appropriate type of feedback. And there's a lot of research on what is good practice, what does a good practice look like, and what is deliberate practice. So let's take a look quickly at this. One thing that we might want to do, and I would encourage you to do when you start working with your athletes, is get a sense of what they can already do. And oftentimes I see with coaches, we start, we, we spend a lot of effort on designing a training session without really getting a sense of what they can already do. So we want to get a sense from them either by having them physically do it or having a conversation with them or having a test in a sense where we would want to know what, at what level would be appropriate for them to do the training. So we want to get a sense of where they are before we start designing a training program. And then we want to understand how their motivation to do the things we're going to do will impact our training. And ideally, and this was the question that you had, ideally we want to keep athletes in that what we might call the sweet spot of learning. We want to keep them in that place where it's just beyond what they, we call them stretch goals. So it's just beyond what they can do at the moment, but with the appropriate support from a coach, they'll be able to reach it. And so you have to keep moving it, right? Because eventually they'll get it and you have to move it again, move it again, move it again. 
And that takes a lot of effort as a coach to, to keep moving those targets just beyond their reach. And you may have heard of the term flow or being in the zone. We want to keep athletes, if, if, they're in the, if, if you put them in positions where they can almost do something and with your support they sometimes can get it, you won't have issues with discipline or boredom because they're going to be very engaged. They're going to be in what we call a flow experience. They're going to, they, they, you won't have many of the issues you have otherwise. So we want to keep them in that sweet spot. And I'll share an example of uh, how one of the world's best teams does this. I was at Red Bull headquarters in California uh, recently, and they train some of the world's best athletes. They have training camps. And what they do is they bring the athletes to these training camps, three, four, five-day training camps. And the whole purpose of these camps is to keep athletes in that learning sweet spot the entire time. So they want to keep them uh, uncomfortable, just a little bit uncomfortable the entire time. And so what, one of the things they do, for example, is they'll have uh, athletes wear heart rate monitors and they'll put them on stage and there'll be a, uh, a screen and you'll be able to see what their heart rate is. And they'll have them do things that they're not comfortable doing so they can see their, their heart rate while they get all anxious and they get excited. And if you just ask them, so for example, um, let's take the world's best snowboarder. So this is someone who has no problem, no fear jumping off a mountain. But then when you ask, so if, if, if they train in those situations, they generally aren't uncomfortable. But if we put them in a situation where they have to speak in front of an audience, they get very uncomfortable. Public speaking generally is very uncomfortable. And so we put them in the, they put them in those uncomfortable kinds of situations, and then they bring a coach in to help coach them through those situations. So in essence, what we want to do with our athletes is help them get comfortable with being uncomfortable, because that's where the best learning occurs, when you're, you're in that uncomfortable kind of space. And if you're going to be anxious all the time when you're in that space, you will not get better. So we want you to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And that's what they do as the world's best athletes. How do we provide feedback when we teach athletes and when we train them? Um, you may have heard of uh, the sandwich technique. You give a positive and then a negative and then a positive when you give feedback to people. Uh, there's even some groups that talk about a magic ratio. So you give a certain number of positive feedbacks before you give a negative feedback. And in fact, there's no evidence to support any of that. The, the best kind of feedback you can give to athletes is when it's genuine and deserved feedback. So athletes respond best when they get feedback that is based on their performance that's genuine and deserved because they want to get better. One of the key reasons kids play sports is to get better, so that you give them feedback that's going to help them get better. We sometimes refer to this as a pull and push approach. So what does a good practice look like? <laughs> what does a good practice look like? Because generally I've seen we don't really do a good job of helping coaches design practices. We give you athletes, we give you facilities, and off you go. So how, much, how long should we, even simple things like how long should we practice? an hour, two hours, three hours. And it's funny because uh, Japan is renowned for their baseball expertise. And the Baseball Little League World Series for 12-year-olds, they've won many times. And so Americans were very curious, what makes Japan so good in baseball? They went and studied it and they found, oh, I know now. They practice 10 hours a day, that's the answer. And you see there was a story about this recently in America. The secret to success, 10-hour practices. And they do practice 10 hours sometimes on Saturday, on weekends and whatnot. And so we want to think, there's this prevailing kind of mindset that more is better, right? And I remember when the Olympics were in Barcelona, Spain, people had t-shirts that said, no pain, no gain, no Spain. It's all about more, 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 more. If you're in the gym two hours, I got to be in three. But what we know, when we look at the best coaches in the research, they do less. They do less, better. Just think about that for a moment. They do less, better. You don't need... We, most in, when we look at the research, most injuries to athletes occur in practices, which is incredible because it's a controlled environment. That should be the safest environment. But I'm convinced that most of those injuries happen because we train too long, too much and too long. And so we want to... This is an example from American football. 
uh, one of the top programs in the country this past year. They had a coach. He's a Hall of Famer. He's won national championships, but he lost one or two games and he got fired. And the first, the next day, the person who was his assistant, the first thing he did was cut practice by practice time by 75%. And the team didn't lose a game. I think they lost one game the rest of the year. So essentially, all he did was get out of the way. We, we put too much on, uh, in our training, generally. So do less, better is what we want to think about there. And these are just some guidelines we see when you look across sports and you look across literature on what might be an appropriate length of time for a practice for different age groups uh, and how often you might want to practice. And again, this is not necessarily with the goal of building an Olympic champion. This is with healthy, appropriate development for different age groups. And we way overcoach, both in competition and in training. And this is based on looking at guidelines and research across all different sports. What seems, and, and again, this is just a guide. This is a guide. But the message is, <laughs> you maybe you can do a little bit less and let them rest. And especially with kids, let them be kids. And I have this quote at the bottom from Coach John Wooden because he used to always remind people, he said, never mistake activity for achievement because it's built into a lot of our cultures that more is better. We, you know, it's a badge of honor. Look how I worked 100 hours this week. I worked 80 hours. I was in the gym 20 hours. Who cares? What were you doing in those hours? Never mistake activity for achievement. And there's four qualities to great practice. And this is from a legendary coach that, that I've worked with, a high school coach working with kids. He said, if you have these four things in a practice, you're going to have a great practice. So are all your activities, your drills on your practice plan, are they, are, are they there for a reason? Is there a purpose for those activities? Do they connect to what you're trying to achieve right now? Do you have variety across your practice? And do you build competition into your practice? And are they at kind of game speed or high speed? So if you have practices that are purposeful, have variety, build in competition, because everyone loves to compete. And if you, if you left your practice and let your kids practice on their own, they're going to play games. They're not going to line up and do drills. They're going to play games. So they want, it's inherently valuable for them. Build competition into your practice and keep them high speed. So if you're doing practices like this, you don't need three hours. You need 90 minutes and, and get out if you have this kind of practice. You could also think about how you structure your practice. So this is just an example of what we call play practice, where you build play into your practice. You get out of drills and more into play, playful activities. But, and you can do that if you structure your environment so that you, you are efficient with your time. This is just, this is a, actually, this is a whole book on examples of how you build those qualities into a practice. And I'll finish, uh, that's this section, I, I think we're going to finish right about here on this section, but um, we, we want to, as much as possible within a training session or a practice session, balance this idea of deliberate practice and free play. So deliberate practice is, is the hard practice. It's the uncomfortable practice. It's how you get better. It's doing things you're not good at. The free play is letting our athletes have ownership of the experience and letting them play on their own. So the free play would kind of be uncoached. The deliberate practice would be the hard stuff. And we want to try and balance these within a practice or across our training sessions so that athletes have moments where they're uncomfortable and they have moments where it's playful. If we can do this, we're going to increase motivation. When we get into a competition, so we have some sense of what we want to do in a practice. When we get into a competition, what do we know about what good coaches do in competition? And it's funny, there was a, <laughs> you see the theme here, overcoaching is a theme. The best coaches, when we compare them, there's actually been a couple of neat studies on this where they looked at ex uh, successful coaches who are experienced and less successful coaches who are inexperienced and they compared them in their mat in competition this was in in football european football looking at how much they coach how much they they talk and intervene in in matches and competitions the best coaches do less they get out of the way 
And so you think of a coach in, in a lot of competitions who feels like, I'm not coaching unless I'm talking to the athletes and yelling at them and getting... The best coaches step back and let the competitions are for the athletes. And, and we see this across all sports now more and more. But we definitely want to make sure during competitions that we're encouraging our athletes. This is a uh, um, world champion decathlete and his coach, a guy named Harry Mara. And we see coaches like this, when, when they do these kinds of things, okay, when they give genuine praise to their athletes for quality performance, their athletes tell us, you know, when, when I get that kind of feedback from my coach in a competition, I, I feel more confident, I'm having more fun, I enjoy being around my coach, and I'm going to try harder. So we, we think about how, what we want to do in competition. We want to kind of get out of the way a little bit, but we do want to give them some feedback and some praise while they're performing because it's going to be challenging. So let's take a look at what you took away from this part. Which of the following is recommended for competition coaching? Let's leave it up just for a second there. Give you a chance to read through these. Which is a recommendation for competition coaching? So we'll, we'll leave that up for a second. This is interesting because, again, you think about how we learn to coach and how we help our athletes perform in these critical moments. And competitions are, are critical moments for our athletes, and ideally we want to be there to support them. So we want to support them, which means we give them feedback as needed. So you see the correct answer here, giving them praise. It's a praise, supporting them for quality performance. Um, this first one, they want constant feedback. We've got to be really careful with that because if we're giving them constant feedback, we're basically getting in the way. We need to get out of the way. Do the teaching and the training in your, in your practices put them in a position to feel confident and perform in their competition and get out of the way. Support them as needed and give them praise. That's, this is what we see with the research. Okay, we'll go back. Okay, so we're going to switch into what we might call end season or end of season. So you've finished a cycle of, of competition and training. What do we know about what good coaches do at this moment? Let's take a look here, another question for you. Primary purpose of end of season evaluations. So you might have an evaluation at the end of your season. What's the primary purpose of that evaluation? Okay, so no one got it right. Too bad. <laughs> you all fail. Uh, okay. So maybe just uh, put A, B, C, D, or E or make a note at your table what you think the answer would be here. Primary purpose of an end of season evaluation. What, what is the main reason for doing an evaluation at the end of the season? And what we want to do is definitely use evaluation to help people get better, to help our coaches improve. You want to, okay, we'll try it for the next one. So this is a big area, a big gap I see with, with coaching where we, we go from an in season to an end season and we just keep moving. We don't pause to take a, a look at what went well and what can we get better at. So at the end of the season, these are some of the things I see great coaches do. They, they do a program evaluation, they do an evaluation for themselves, and then they also make time to recognize their athletes. So program evaluation, coach evaluation, and athlete recognition. These are three keys for quality coaching at the end of season. And we often, sometimes it's common for coaches to think, well, season's over, now my job is done. But in fact, your job is far from being done. The best coaches view the end of season as a key time to get better with their program and with their athletes. And when we think of our program, so if you're coaching at a, in a club, for example, we would want to do an evaluation at the club level, not just for us personally as coaches, but at the club level to get a sense of what, what are we doing well with our program. And so there's, we have to balance these things between what we might consider program evaluation considerations. So what, what am I going to evaluate? What should we evaluate? How will I get information on that? What are some of the different tools I might use? And then how am I going to use those results? And some of the questions we might ask should tie back to the things that matter. So I should be evaluating how we did on our core values, how we were as a team with our trust, 
Did my athletes get better, both in performance and in development? So it's a balance between the, these types of questions we should be asking and what we're going to do with this information. And this is what the best programs do. This is an example of uh, something we've done with some of the high schools that we work with, where we identify what we call a program evaluation card, or almost like a report card. And at the end of the season, we go through that process of identifying what are the things that really matter in this program. And with this particular school, we identified four things that matter for school-based sport. One is participation. So it, without this, the only evaluation is what was your record? How many games did you win? With this, we get and see how many kids came out to play. That's participation. So how many kids are, are on our team? Retention is how many kids come back, how many athletes come back to our program. Engagement is did they enjoy the experience? Was it something they enjoyed? And competitiveness is the win-loss record uh, or part of that. So we get a score. We get a score at the end of the season that's meaningful for helping us get better. We can identify the areas that are important to us and we can score them and we can use those to get better. And we think about coach evaluation. So this is a very um, controversial topic I see all over the world. We don't do a very good job of this. And when we do do coach evaluation, typically it's very um, either unprofessional or unhelpful. This is one of our Olympic coaches, and he's a 12-time coach of the year in the United States, diving coach. And this is his uh, response to coach evaluation. He says, coach evaluation, what's that? I've never been evaluated, only once. And typically when we do evaluations, we, it's, it's from uh, paper and pencil form. It's not from someone who's ever actually watched us coach or been around us as a coach. So how can we know if we're doing a good job as a coach? How will we know if we're meeting those targets that we've set? And so ideally when we do coach evaluation, we want to make sure that we're getting feedback from as many different sources as possible, as many different uh, people. So we should be getting feedback from our athletes, from other coaches, from parents, from administrators, support, uh, support staff. We want to get as much information as we can to help us get better, and the best coaches do that. This is an example of some questions that uh, a successful running coach has used in the United States. At the end of every season, he asks himself these questions. You know, what went right? Did my team buy into that vision? Did they peak at the right time? Did a bad attitude corrupt the unity of the team? So it doesn't have to be um, a formal type of evaluation, but something that gives us an opportunity to reflect on how we did. And there's also been a big movement to identify strength. There, typically when we think about evaluating at the end of the season, we go right to what didn't go well? What went wrong? What do we need to fix? But the best coaches spend as much time asking, what went well? What did we do really well? What am I really good at? What did I do well as a coach? And this comes from the business literature where there's been a big movement to focus on strength. What, let's focus on our strength, not just our weaknesses. In fact, it's much more fun to focus on our strengths anyways. And one of the, this is a question I pose with coaches when I work with them and I do clinics. So you finish your season at the end of the season and you ask yourself, what was your best day of coaching this past season or this past year? And why was it your best day? So think about how this is a different mindset than let's identify all the things that didn't go well and that we're not working, uh, that aren't working. So we focus on, think back to when you had your best day at coaching this, with this team. And what made that such a great day? Because what that's going to do is it's going to help you identify your strength as a coach. That's when you were at your best as a coach. Let's do more of that. Let's make that more regular. Last part of an end season, uh, end of season moment might be recognizing your athletes. And it's common in a lot of places where we have banquets and award banquets and things like that. And we recognize athletes for their achievements. And we typically give out awards for most valuable player or top scorer. But what about awards that connect back to our core values and our vision and our behavior standards? So go right back to the beginning of your season when you get together with your team. These are some examples uh, I've seen from different teams where they have awards 
that the awards that you give out at the end of your season should connect back to your core values and your standards. It's just another moment to reinforce what matters to us and why we do what we do. And these are just a few examples. All right, we'll do another poll. Leave it up just for a second. So all program evaluation systems should include tools for measuring what? What should be the focus of our evaluation tools at the end of a season? All right, so you did get that one. For sure, we would want, ideally, we would want to assess all of these things, but the main priority at the end of the year, we want to ask ourselves, did my athletes get any better? That's the main thing that we want to evaluate. Did my athletes get any better? All right, so you made it through a cycle of coaching. You went from starting with a team, actually coaching a team or athletes, finishing a season or a cycle of coaching. Now you can stop for a moment. You can pause before you start that next cycle again. What do we know about what good coaches do then? So I'm going to skip this one here, and we're going to go to what we know about what good coaches do in the off season. And there's two areas that we want to focus on in the off season: coach wellness and ongoing learning. So recharging as a coach and then getting better as a coach. These are the two things that I see great coaches do. And when we think about coach wellness, we know for a fact that what you do is hard. It's emotionally draining. It's physically draining. And you see a, pic a picture here of Jose Mourinho and also a picture of a, a famous American football coach. And this is a quote from him, you know, pushing athletes to accomplish what they consider or don't consider achievable is a long, painful process, as much for the coach as the player. And we see there's been some research that's kind of tracked coaches' burnout and exhaustion over a season. And it's hard. It's very hard. So you're, in a sense, you're emptying your tank emotionally and physically throughout a season. You need ways to refill that tank. And we also know that coaches, the best coaches, are very self-critical. And we see this, this is from a study with Olympic coaches. They, they, they're what we call serial doubters, or they have serial insecurity. So as a coach, the best coaches are always questioning themselves. And that's, that's natural and it can be healthy, but it can also lead to a lot of burnout because you're always trying to get better. And one of the strategies I've seen with uh, great coaches and great leaders is that they, they start this idea of um, starting your day on offense. So you think about as a coach, you spend pretty much all day on defense. You spend most of your day solving other people's problems, helping other people. So if you don't spend some time at the beginning of your day on yourself, it's easy to, to lead to more burnout. So the best leaders and the best coaches, what we've seen with them, is they take some time at the beginning of the day to do things for themselves, be very selfish. And they call this starting your day on offense. And if you've flown recently, you know when they do the flight demonstration, the safety demonstration, they always say, when, you know, in the case of an emergency, when the mask drops down, make sure you secure your mask before you secure someone else's. It's the same idea here. You have to recharge your battery before you can charge other people's batteries. So you have to be a little bit selfish before you start. And what I've seen more and more with a lot of great coaches at the moment is this, this uh, kind of shift to being more mindful. And this has been around for centuries, but it, it seems to be coming back with coaching at the moment to focusing on becoming more mindful of, of your coaching and mindfulness training. And here's a few examples of coaches who, who do that. Um, and in fact, Coach Wooden, uh, going back before this was popular, actually made time to write out what he called a mindfulness creed. So he had a, a list of things that he tried to do every day, realizing that he probably wouldn't be able to do it. So it was a goal, it wasn't necessarily something he had to do, but he tried to do these things every day. And this was a way for him to recharge his energy, his battery as a coach before he tried to help other people. And there's even, there's lots of apps now. These are two popular apps that I've seen with coaches. One's called Headspace, and the other one's called Smiling Mind. And these are 
a um, apps that coaches have shared with me uh, in different places that help them stay a little bit more mindful of what they're doing and stay, stay fresh as a coach. So we'll finish with ongoing learning. So the last thing that we want to think about what great coaches do when they get to the off-season, they don't stop, they just change. So off-season isn't a time to stop, it's a time to change and evolve. And this is one of my favorite quotes from Coach Wooden again, you know, what matters most is what you learn after you know it all. And you, I've, I've come across coaches who kind of are comfortable with what they know, say it's good enough. But if you're not comfortable with good enough, the off season is the perfect time for you to, to get better. And in fact, this idea of ongoing learning is, is all that second row in the coaching pyramid. And that definition of coaching effectiveness, it's, it's the um, ability to keep pushing yourself into wanting to get better as a coach. So what do we see with some of the coaches, that, how they get better? There's a couple things that we found. One, this was a high school coach, a high school coach who wanted to get better. And he connected with Coach Warden, and we actually were able to follow him for 10 years. And we looked at how he got better as a coach. And in fact, he was, he was failing as a coach. He was going to get fired. He was not successful. He, wasn't, he was not enjoying coaching. And he decided, I need to really invest in getting better. And we followed him, and he became a, a very successful coach. And so what did he do? These are the four things he did. He focused on identifying what we call high performance impact, um, high impact performance gaps. So what are the things that matter most? If I could identify three or four things each year that really will make a big impact, if I get better on these three things, it will make a big impact. You identify those, he designed a plan to get better at those few things, and then you practice those things. But you need to collect evidence, you need to collect data. So it can't be a feeling. You can't finish your off season saying, I think I got better, I feel like I got better. You need to show, I did get better. Do you collect evidence and do you collect data to show that you're getting better? And then you take small incremental steps to getting better, but you stay focused on identifying how you're getting better. And it can be summarized in this simple quote, think evolution, not revolution. And I've seen many times where, and we see it when we fire coaches, think in professional sport. The average uh, length of a career in professional English Premier League and, and football right now is 1.1 years. What you get one year. So how do you get better in a year? You don't have time to grow. And oftentimes a new coach or when you come in, you might want to have a, a, do a big change. The best coaches do small changes all the time. Small change, incremental. Think evolution, not revolution. The last part here, how can I get better as a coach in the off season? There's two things that I see great coaches do. They identify a topic to study or they identify a coach to study. Study a topic or study coaches. We think about studying topics, we could pick something that we want to get better at and then we study it. We basically create a little experiment or a little study to try and get better at it. This is John Wooden again and he did this this is from Coach Wooden. Every year for 40 years, at the end of his season, in the off-season, he would identify things that he wants to get better at, and he would go out and conduct a study on getting better at that. Coach Bill Belichick here, he's one of the most popular coaches in the world at the moment, uh, of American football, and he makes every one of his assistants pick one thing to get better at every off-season. So as a staff, as a group, if every one of our coaches is getting better at just one thing every off-season, that's how they win every year. They're always getting better. The other option is I'm going to study a coach. So maybe I study a topic, maybe I'll study a coach. If I study a coach, I want to identify people, that I, other coaches that I want to go and learn from. And this is a nice example. Uh, Jordan Spieth uh, was ranked number one in the world for a little while. He's one of the top golfers in the world. His coach, a guy named Cameron McCormick, identified that if I want to continue to be able to serve this person and help them get better, I need to get, keep getting better with him. So he decided one off season, I'm going to write a letter to the top 75 golf coaches in the United States. And I'm going to ask them one question. Can I come watch you coach? And 15 of them wrote back and said, yeah. And one of them happened to be Tiger Woods' coach when he was number one in the world. 
And so he was able to reach out and go and watch them coach. So this is our last question. How do quality coaches view learning and collaboration? What do quality coaches think about getting better? Okay, we'll leave that up for a second. So this is beautiful. You, this is exactly what we're trying to achieve here today and tomorrow is the idea of giving away what we know, openly sharing what we know with other coaches. It's not about protecting what we know as an advantage. The best coaches give it away because that's how they get better. They give and other people give them back. You got it. They're more than happy to share their wisdom. So you reach out to a coach that you want to learn from. The best, if they're a good coach, they'll probably say, for sure, come watch. Let's share. So we've gone through all four phases. Those are just a few of the examples of things that I've seen great coaches do to get better in each of those moments, those critical moments as a coach. Thank you very much.